Oh no, I'm invisible. Um Right. Calgary, just let me know if the audio works. I'm gonna fix the video. One sec. But like throw in throw in a thumbs up or something if you do hear the audio. Cool. Alright, and I should appear on your screen in a, in a second arena here. Yeah. Is the audio working for you? No, not the audio. Is the video working for you? Can you just kind of see me see me move a little bit? Yeah. I'm going to move the camera a little bit. Uh -huh. Oh, God, that went way off, eh? Okay, it looks like I'm more centered. Awesome. Okay. How do you do, everyone? Uh, just going to get right into it. Today, we're talking about a secret topic. Very secret topic. It's going to be week, let's see, week four, day five. Secret topic. Um, now... Can can somebody close that door over there? Sweet. Now the reason I say this is a secret is because well, I'm going to talk about it in a minute. Uh, I did want to start off just by saying like, how are your midterms coming along? How are you enjoying that process? Good time? Bad times? Tough times, right? Um, what's 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 mostly kind of tough about it? Mm-hmm. Right. So for Calgary, looks like most of the issues are things like remembering to work on branches instead of master. When do I pull? When do I push? That kind of stuff. Just get related things. Cool, cool. And then as with um with the actual coding of it, does that feel mostly all right or you know, I, like there aren't too many new concepts, I guess, being thrown into the midterm. It's just like synthesizing everything you've done so far. Right. I find that with the midterms, like the biggest part of it is the um, the group portion of it, um, as in communicating with everyone. As Danilla says here, it's difficult to put all the pieces together, right? And yeah, again, again like, like that synthesizing process, um, it's good that you get to experience this now. And keep in mind, like, you're going to do your final project in, like, a, a month. Um, and when you get there, it will really just be, like, midterm projects V2, right? Where you can take anything that you find didn't work too well in your process for the midterm projects. So whether that was figuring out a good Git workflow or doing your wireframes a little bit better or, you know, using Post-it notes or whatever, now, you can take all, all all your lessons from the midterm project and bring them into the final and and be more efficient there, right? So, one thing that I kind of like do recommend doing, um, which I don't really see very many people do, is take notes on the soft parts of uh like of the midterm as you're going through it, like what you just said about Git. Right? Take notes about those issues that you run into Git like detailed, right? So that you can address that stuff when you go back to another project, i.e., you know, in four weeks, right? Um, if you find that like your presentations are on, are on Monday, right? If you find that something is a little tough in the process of preparing and presenting your presentation, right? Make notes about that stuff, right? This bootcamp isn't just about learning to become like a coder. It is also about learning to become a developer, right? Like putting together projects and showing other people your projects, right? Um, those are all skills that I really suggest kind of like mindfully working on. Um, so yeah, there you go. That's my little kind of spiel about that. We can talk about that a little bit more as we kind of go forward because today's lecture is a little weird. Um, does anybody know what today's lecture is called? User authentication. 
Have you done user authentication before? Yeah, it kind of, kind of feels like you have. So this isn't just going to be the same lecture again, right? Like, I'm not just going to go through the exact same stuff. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about, like, the theoretical stuff and a little bit about, like, cryptography a little bit. Um, for the most part, we're just going to explore what does authentication mean. And really, I'm just going to make this some time for, you know, if you have any questions about stuff, like, we can explore into that. Today's lecture is not a lecture about stuff that is, like, curriculum. Right? Like, you're in the middle of working on your projects. I'm not going to throw more stuff at you that's, like, mandatory to know. Um, think about today as more of, like, a light advanced lecture. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's just special interest topics. So, you know, heads up, if anything that I'm showing you today kind of goes over your head, or, or if I make any mistakes, <laughs> which I might, right? Um, the, the, the risk on this lecture, very low. Very low. Almost none. Right? We're just going to have a good time. Um, yes. So, let's see. Let's see. Wanted to talk about that. Hmm. Okay. So, can I, can I borrow one of those index cards? Thanks. Uh, yeah, just one is good. And then do you have a pen? I should have a pen, but... Oh, no, I got some pens here. Okay, so what we're going to do is I'm going to write a secret message. Ooh, very secret message. Um, so y'all can't see it. Y'all over here can't see it. Very secret. Okay, so I've written some secret, secret stuff here, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna give this to to some lucky person in in Vancouver. Um, anybody want to be the secret person? You don't want to share a secret with me? I've written my deepest, most personal. All right, keep keep it safe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh yeah, so you may you may look at it without without showing it to anyone. Aha. Uh -huh. Mhm. Mm yes. So I have a co-conspirator here, and now I will ask you a series of questions. What is Oh, and uh, the the thing there, that has to do with the answer. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so what is two plus five? Mm, so the answer here is twelve. What about the rest of you? What is two plus five? Yes, seven. Mm hmm. Well, I I think it's twelve. And Calgary here says. 25. Good good try, Thomas. <laughs> um, what is, and then this is, this is for everyone but John. Um, what is 3 plus 1? Mm, okay, so, so the guess here is 5. Any other guesses? So your x says 3 plus 1 is 4. And I like how you really thoughtfully said that. <laughs> uh, 3 plus 1, yes. Let me draw on my experiences, yeah. Uh, three plus one might be four. Uh, John, what is three plus one? It's actually six. Three plus one is six. Let's do one last one. I think you all are getting close. What is ten minus three? What's ten minus three? Hmm. It's not. It's not that. Oh, come on. Ten minus three. Let's Google this. 10 minus 3, I mean, I would assume it would be 7. I would assume. <laughs> it's, it's 12, isn't it? 
So, John and I can just keep communicating back and forth and look at y'all's stupid faces. <laughs> um, right? A little bit of confusion. If I mean, if we kept going on, do you think maybe you'd be able to figure out a pattern? Maybe. Maybe. But for right now, we can just keep communicating back and forth. A little secret numbers here. Um, so what we're doing, what we're doing is, is establishing some like, some public line of communication, right, where the rest of you are, are able to like, you know, listen in on the messages that I'm sending back and forth, but the messages have been in some form, in some form they've been like encrypted. Right? The messages have been encrypted somehow because uh, John and I share a secret, right? And that secret can be used to decrypt messages. So I'm the one encrypting the messages. John is the one decrypting the messages. It is John, right? Yes, OK. I, I, <laughs> I had to check this whole time. Um, um, John's the one decrypting the messages. And w the interesting thing about this is that, again, the rest of you can listen in, right? And you have no idea what's going on. Now, this whole kind of situation, it hinges on the fact that John and I had to physically exchange some secret key at the beginning of the transactions, right? We had to establish the fact that we had some secret. Otherwise, if I'm over here and I'm like, what, what, was, the, what was the code there? <laughs> There you go. So it was add five to every odd number, add two to every even number, right? Um, just, just trying to mess with you a little bit there. If the answer, like if the key was just add five to every number, right? It'd be pretty easy for you after asking, you know, after hearing three or four of, bless you, three or four of these exchanges, you might have figured out, oh, he's just adding five to every one of the numbers, right? Right, every one of the answers, like bef like he's saying it with an added five. Um, I made it a little tricky by having an odd and even rule, right? I might make it even trickier by going like multiples of three, multiples of four, or multiples of two or something, right? Um, we can make our secret kind of arbitrary cl arbitrarily complex. And our secret in this case here was made up of kind of two parts. It was made up of like an algorithm, right? Our secret was made up of some some kind of set of steps to uh, perturb the input. Right? Some set of steps that, given an input, you would transform it with. And there are also parameters to those steps. Right. So the steps here were if odd add, you know, x, and if even, add y. And the parameters were things like x is, was x 2? Yeah, and then y is 5. So, technically, this thing here, like, I could make this part public. I could tell everybody, I could tell all of you, hey, the messages that I'm transmitting, um, if you really want to understand them, you have to have an x and a y, and these are the steps that you would do with the x and y. Right? So the algorithm itself I can make public, and the parameters to those steps, those are the things that need to stay secret. These are the things that need to stay secret. And even if my algorithm was just something like add x, as long as I keep those parameters secret, then for some amount of time at least, everybody else is unable to decipher my messages. Right? Now, this is kind of going to be the, uh, the heart of what we're talking about today. Um, we're just going to dive into more and more of this kind of idea in slightly more technical ways. This idea makes sense to everyone, though? OK. So 
I'm going to really spell this out. This relies on us securely exchanging keys. Secret keys. And when I say exchanging, I mean, I in this case, I've given a secret key. If John wanted to secretly message me as well, John might give me, like, his secrets so that we could set up, you know, a secure kind of line of communication between the two of us, right, both of which are not kind of relying on each other. So it relies on us securely exchanging secret keys. It also relies on something else. It relies on kind of limited communication. Because the thing is, after a couple messages, people can start to clue in on the patterns. Right? After a few messages, you, you start cluing in. You're like, hey, I get it. I know what's going on here. Right? And as you start building up more and more and more messages that the rest of you are listening to, right? You build up this pool, you could run statistical analysis on it or something, right? You could figure stuff out. And we're going to look at some more examples of that to kind of uh, to kind of make that a little clearer. So I have I just have a like a set of things that I want to go through here. Ba -ba -ba -ba. Yeah. So we have a situation here that's like physical, right? The rest of you are able to listen to me as I transmit my messages, right? I was just shouting the messages out loud. The internet is not unlike that. You have, you know, a computer, and your computer is, you know, connected to the Wi-Fi, and the Wi-Fi's got, you know, a little cable that goes all the way to, you know, whatever. And the whole world is just kind of spanned by these cables and wires. And through these cables pass, you know, electrical signals, right, or, or light signals. It's stuff that can be intercepted. I could, you know, take a wire and, like, snip, snip, and put my own little wires in between. And any messages that come through, I could read them and then just forward them. Right? Like a game of telephone. It's not unthinkable that somebody might be able to intercept messages read them and then just pass them on. So the internet world is similar to me shouting out things right now because if I was to if I was to do the example instead of me asking the questions out loud saying what's 2 plus 5 or what's 4 plus 3, I might write it on a piece of paper and I'm too far from John. I'm too far from John to talk to John directly, so I'm going to have to pass it to people and people are going to have to pass it there. And I have to trust I have to trust that people won't open up the message. That's how the internet works, right? Like, we're not all connected to Facebook directly, for example. Right? Like, my computer does not have one, like, cable that goes directly to Facebook. It has to go through other people's machines. It has to go through, you know, routers and switches and yada, yada, yada. I have to trust somehow that the people who've installed those routers, right, or the other people who are also connected to those routers somehow, right? I have to trust that they don't open up the messages, read them, and pass them on. Because without any extra security, there's no way for me to know that those messages haven't been read. So if I encrypt my messages, even if people open them up, Right? What's 2 plus 5? Well, I don't know what's going on if I've never had the secret. So this transmission of the secret also needs to happen in some secure way. It also needs to happen in some secure way. And just to motivate this, let's put it this way. I might need to communicate with Facebook. Right? I might need to communicate with Facebook to say, hey, post the status. And Facebook needs to know that that message came from me. 
So we're going to talk about how Facebook is going to verify that message came from me in a sec. But it needs to know that a message came from me. And anybody in between, anybody in between that me sending that message and Facebook receiving that message should not be able to decipher that message in a way so that they can learn how to format their own messages about me. So nobody should be able to inter intercept my messages on the way to Facebook, look at them and say, ah, now I know how I can pretend to be Nima and post new statuses. So when you sign up for Facebook, what's the process that you go through? You like go to you know Facebook.com and it's like, oh I don't have an account. Let me sign up. My name is Nima Boscarino. My phone number is don't have one. Uh, my password is, you know, some other stuff. I fill out all this info. And then I click sign up and I get my I get my account set up. Now, at some point there some secrets have been exchanged. Did somebody physically come to you when you set up a Facebook account? No. Nobody physically like showed up at your house or like sent you a letter. You know, when you sign up for a Facebook account, Mark Zuckerberg can't just like, all right, time to show up at, you know, Billy's house. Welcome to Facebook. Um, yeah, I've only got five minutes. So here's, you know, I printed out your little, your little passcode, uh, your secret. Here you go. This is what you can use to securely communicate with me. Um, and then I've, I've got to be off. I have to fly off to, uh, to Belgium. Somebody just signed up for a new account. You know, that, it doesn't really work that way. There's got to be some other way instead of what we just did, which was physically meet each other to exchange these keys. So enter something called the uh, Diffie-Hellman key exchange. Okay, so what I'm going to show you in a second, right, what I'm going to show and explain in a second basically hinges on the fact that this algorithm here, again, this, this process that we went through, if I wanted to figure out a way for us to exchange keys so that we can do this without actually meeting, I need something like this Diffie-Hellman key exchange algorithm. So here's this little picture. Yeah. Oh, that's not visible at all. Okay. I know the text is pretty small. Uh, Calgary, I hope you can see pretty well. Can everybody here kind of see the text a little bit? Yeah? Cool. I'm going to work through the steps. Basically, imagine there are two people. So in this case, here is me and John. Here it's Alice and Bob. There's two people who want to communicate with each other. Um... And they know that the way that they're going to communicate with each other is going to be through public channels. But they want to communicate in a way that is not decipherable, so they need to establish a secret. So Alice and Bob, they might agree on a common thing. So in the, um, in the analogy that they're using here for the explanation, we're going to look at the idea is paint. Right, we're going to be talking with colors. Uh, in actual computer science, it would be numbers. So maybe Alice says, "Hey, you know what? Let's just use let's just use a yellow paint as our common paint." Right, this is like an initiating place. So Bob and Alice both agree. All right, it's just going to be yellow. That's fine. When Alice tells the world that the common color is yellow. Everybody knows this. Everybody knows that the, color, the common color is yellow. So you all, you all can hear this. Alice then decides on a secret color for themselves. Right? So Alice here has picked this orangey color. And Bob also 
decides a secret color for themselves. And these secret colors are not broadcast to the world. So both Alice and Bob have a common color that they've shared and a secret color that they've kept secret. And what they can do with the colors is mix them. Right? Mixing colors is a thing that, like, if I had two paints, I can just stir the paint in. Easy enough. Right? Stirring it is fine. And now both Alice and Bob have ended up with these public colors that they will share with the world. Right? Or they'll share with each other. So Alice gets the yellow and the orange and makes this, you know, slightly lighter orange. Bob gets the yellow and this like turquoisey thing and makes this blue thing. And through public channels transfers that stuff. So everybody might see that oh Alice is sending this and Bob is sending this. But the thing is nobody's seen the secret and unstirring paint is really difficult. Stirring paint is easy, but unstirring paint is virtually impossible, right? And we're going to be thinking about numbers. There's operations with numbers where combining two numbers is easy, but pulling those two numbers apart is really hard. So both Alice and Bob have exchanged these mixed colors, assuming that separating the mix is difficult. And then what happens is that both Alice and Bob can re-add their secrets. Now, stirring colors, stirring colors is a thing that doesn't need to happen in some order. If I have red and blue and green, I can stir red with blue and then stir green into it. Or I can also stir red with green and then stir blue into it. Right? Stirring is a, is, a, is a method that doesn't need to happen in some order. And that's what we get to do here is that Alice ends up with something that has that common color and the light blue that was secret to Bob. And then Alice can add the red to it that was secret to Alice. And the same thing goes for Bob. Bob ends up with the common plus the red, you know, sent over. And then Bob can add their secret blue in it. Notice that Bob never actually saw the secret red. And Alice never actually saw the secret blue. They just ended up with a mixture of it and then added their own thing to it. And since that combination doesn't need to happen in some order, both of them end up with a common secret. And then they can use this common secret in that algorithm that I just talked about, right, somehow. So if, so if my algorithm there wasn't add, you know, two to every odd number or whatever, right, involved colors. Now I've got a color secret that you can do. If I said something like blue and you get to add turquoise to it because that's our secret that we've done, right? Now, do you see what, what I'm kind of getting to, right? We can use this process to establish secret keys without ever actually transmitting our raw secret keys. So this is a process known as the Diffie-Hellman key exchange. Right? Diffie-Hellman key exchange. And it's, it's just that. It doesn't need to really involve math. It's just this idea of taking advantage of a process that is easy to do, but really difficult to undo. Right? So stirring paint together is really you know, easy to do but really difficult to undo. All right, in terms of math, multiplying numbers together, very easy. Right? I can take two numbers and multiply them, easy peasy. Right? You get a second grader to do that. But factoring numbers into primes, that's really hard. That's really hard. If I gave you, let's, let's think of some, OK, 131 is prime. Yo, 131's a prime. Nice. Anybody want to guess another big prime? Uh, I'm going to go 193 is prime. 
Oh, yo, another prime. Look at that. Why don't they just hire me to find primes? 193 is a prime. So if I did 131 times 193, I end up with this beast. 25283. Now, 25283, not a prime number. A prime number is any number that is only divisible by, you know, itself and one. Here I have a number that can be divided into 131 and 193. So if I asked you, given just this number, can you factor it into primes? Can you divide it into two prime numbers? What would you do? I have no idea. I have no idea what you would do, right? This, this is hard. This would take a while because you'd have to just test numbers. You just have to test, okay, like, do these two numbers add up to that? Do these other two numbers add up to that? What if I gave you one of these? List of prime numbers up to... Oh, you know what? We'll go number 100. Okay, so you can go... Thousand. What if I gave you oh there's there's a ton of these, eh? One of one of these beast numbers. Right? Like these numbers can get big. Right? Um give you this dude over here. Right? We're getting into the many digits at this point. Right? And the list of prime numbers is, you know, infinite largest prime number. The largest prime number as of January 2019 is whatever this thing is, whatever this horrific thing is. How many digits does it have? Oh, cool. A cool, you know, 24 million digits. Right? Just a ooh, nice spicy prime number. So. Here's a process where, again, multiplying two numbers together, easy. Easy. We all know how to multiply, but to pull those things apart is hard. So at the basis of it, and we're not going to dive deep into the math of it. This is about as deep as we're going to go. The basis of it, cryptography is built up of this process right, of using the vast assortment of prime numbers with gigantic numbers of digits and using those as a process for generating secret keys. Cool. Stuff is pretty cool. If this is something that you're interested in, I really recommend looking at some computer science stuff, right? Or message me, and I'll send you all the things that I don't get to use anymore after doing my computer science degree. Um, I took a couple classes in this stuff. It's cool. Um, as web developers, you don't get to do a bunch of math. Um, but if you're thinking of doing a CS degree, right, and this kind of tickles you a little bit, that's good. You can like go ahead. Any questions about this? OK. So I said that the algorithm is called the Diffie-Hellman key exchange, the one for coming up with secrets. The Diffie-Hellman key exchange. And this is the basis for what we'll call, where'd I go? Diffie-Hellman is the basis for what we'll call the uh, private key cryptography. Oh, no, why did I say that? Public key cryptography. public key exchange. Because the thing about the Diffie-Hellman ex uh, key exchange is that somebody needs to publish a public key. Um, we will talk about a thing called RSA in a sec. But 
I want to talk a little bit about why it's called the Diffie-Hellman key exchange. Why do you think it's called the Diffie-Hellman key exchange? It might be a name. Yeah. What's that? The, the Mayo, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, the, the people, the Mayo people came up with it. They needed to, to exchange secret mayo, so they stir mayo and relish together. Oh, how do we, <laughs> how do we separate the mayo and the relish? Um, no, it was named, you know, Diffie Hellman because it was developed by Whitfield Diffie and Martin Hellman. Or was it? Right? Or was it? It was named, named after, named after Whitfield Diffie and Martin Hellman, but originally conceptualized by Ralph Merkel. Why isn't it the Ralph Merkel key exchange? Hmm. Hmm. The thing about the Diffie-Hellman key exchange is that it was not public knowledge for quite a bit of time. So the Diffie-Hellman key exchange was uh, see, the British. The scheme. Let me, let me zoom in on this in a way that's actually legible for y'all. The scheme was first published by Whitfield Diffie and Martin Hellman in 1976. But in 1997, it was revealed that James H. Ellis, Clifford Cox, and Malcolm J. Williamson of GH, GCHQ, look at that dystopian building. Dystopia, it's like a donut UFO, right? The British Signals Intelligence Agency had previously in 1969 shown that public key cryptography could be achieved. So the thing that I've shown you, that whole kind of idea of, of transferring that stuff, including some of the math underneath it, um, was published publicly by these researchers, Whit Whitfield Diffie and Martin Hellman. Right? 1976 and it was years it was years in 1997 it was revealed that the like like a government agency the GCHQ these people here intelligence and security organization right of the UK they had known how to do this stuff since 1969 so there were seven years Seven years where, where, where these people were hiding math. Right? You said conspiracy. Absolutely. Hiding math? Are you serious? Can you imagine if we, f like we find out that there's a better way to do division? Right? And the UK has been hiding it this whole time? Right? Like we've, we've been doing long division or whatever this whole time. They're like, mmm, they're drinking their tea and, you know, they've, the, you know, Diffie Crumpet Long Division. What I like, I like. I mean, that's that's bewildering to me. At what point? At what point are we okay with keeping something secret and some things not? Because this whole thing, the paint, d should this really be secret? I'll tell you that the math behind this stuff is actually not super hard. Right? If you take like a math class, like you'll be able to, like one like university math level class, like you'll be able to get the math underneath it. Um, so at what point are we kind of like okay with people hiding these kinds of ideas? Right? Um, just wanted to kind of bring that up. This is stuff that people don't like really know about, right? Maybe tonight at the dinner table, you know? Actually, y'all don't have dinner with people anymore. Y'all stay here until like 10. Uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe tonight on the train as you're going home, um, you know, tap the other sleeping person on the shoulder and be like, hey, did you know that the GCHQ hid the Diffie-Hellman key exchange for seven years or eight years, however long that was? Right. Just something to kind of keep in mind, some food for thought. Is anybody as enraged about this as I am? Right? What if there was another method for tying your shoes? 
right? Like, this whole thing, the reason they kept this stuff secret is for, like, military purposes, right? For intelligence purposes. So they figured out, oh, this thing gives us an edge over other countries. But what if, what if the, the U.S. military has come up with a great way of tying your shoelaces um, that's just great for their, for their army? And they don't want other people to know about it. That's legitimately the equivalent. And the thing about the Diffie Hellman Key Exchange is that as soon as this thing was kind of published publicly, right, this it, it was revolutionary in terms of becoming one of the earliest practical examples of public key exchange, which is the basis is the basis of how the internet works. Is the basis of how security works on the internet. So one might even think like, hey, if this stuff had been released earlier on, right, how much further ahead could we be? Because on the internet, as I said, these are public channels. We don't have a private cable between every computer to have private communication. So I think we're going to take a short break. Or a longish break. Let's take like a 12 minute break. Does that sound good? Treat you to two extra minutes. Um, don't spend them all in one place. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And then, um, and then we'll come back. So at whatever 12 minutes from now, whatever 12 minutes from now is, we'll just come back. Sound good? Cool. Your, your timer has started.
a different one. There's one called Slytherin. What's up? Um, I want to be the Guy Fieri of of lectures. Like, whoa, welcome to, you know, <laughs> like, yeah, I gotta gotta get frosted tips every, really every couple months. I change up my like inspiration or like method of lecturing. Um, Calgary just toss me a thumbs up if the audio is working. Um, and the video, I guess. The audio and the video working? Wait, maybe I'll just wait. Calgary, let me know when it's... Okay, awesome. So, before we dive back into uh, cryptography, you know, we're not really... We're not going to do really, like, user auth today. It's... it's, <laughs> it's if you want to see what the... What I get for... So when when you are ready for a lecture, like you can see this thing and it says goal. We'll cover how to use session cookies to implement user registration, uh, sign in and sign out with best practices such as password encryption. But like you've already done this, right? You did Tiny App, right? So it's like I could go through Tiny App again if you want. And then the other part here is we'll talk about different ways to store the user state and the advantages and disadvantages of each method. And then I'm the lecturer and I'm like, okay. I got the teacher notes. Let's see what the teacher notes t for today look like. Oh, to do. Right, all right. <laughs> so, <laughs> so everybody does the lecture in like a different way. Because um, again, what I'm saying is you're working on your projects. Uh, you know, I'm not, we're not gonna throw more stuff at you today. That would be cruel. Um, so two things that I wanna talk about before I get back into crypto. Um, first is, uh, I, I was saying I, I like change my inspiration for lecturing every you know every month or every two months. So for a while, I was doing the um, "You Suck at Photoshop." I don't know if anybody's ever seen this. "You Suck at Photoshop" was it's like a, a video series from like quite a while ago um, about um, like Photoshop techniques, right? It's just tutorials on how to use Photoshop. And the thing about it is, like, it's all based around this this person's character. Like, they play a, a character of, like, their life is falling apart. So they're like, hey, it's Danny. Welcome to You Suck at Photoshop. Uh, today we're going to look at how to use the clone tool, uh, you know, to hide objects. And he's like, here's a picture of, you know, some treacherous hand with a, a band of betrayal and uh, we want to hide this this ring of deceit so you just kind of <laughs> kind of just goes through like h how to hide the ring using different like techniques and, and and every once in a while you hear like he's just kind of sobbing and in the background you hear like his wife being like Danny Danny come back my bags these bags aren't gonna pack themselves right um, and every single, like, every single episode is something like that. Um, so, so I used to do my lectures around, like, my life is falling apart, and it was just fun. Um, then a couple people were like, Nima, are you, like, okay? And I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm okay. Like, it's, it's fine. Um, then there's, you know, Bob Ross. So, I, you know, it's hard to do coding lectures in a Bob Ross style, but I tried. It didn't really work out. Um, that's a happy little bug. Okay. And then... Yeah, <laughs> and then I I honestly think guy f guy fiery guy Fietti, I'm gonna go for the full on like. Yeah, like welcome to Code Town, right? Like, <laughs> so. You know, look forward to that when you come back from Remote Week. I'll have, <laughs> I'll have, I'll have this whole thing going on. Like, whoa, it's time to come. <laughs> uh, before is that a thing? To it? <laughs> no. Oh, this is somebody's physics teacher. Yeah, like there's no way. I don't. I wish I hadn't seen that. <laughs> yeah. Oh man, that's that's genuinely upsetting to me. Guy Fieri is apparently a really awesome person. Um. So. Uh, I'm just going to toss a little note for myself in here. Guy. 
So how do you pronounce this? Huh? Yeah, they say Fieri. He says it with a D, like Guy Fieri. And he's like Italian. And he's like, that's how Italians say it. I'm like, I'm Italian. It's Fieri. Yeah, Boscarino. Yeah, it's not Boscadino, man. Get out of here. No, well, anyways, that's enough about Guy Fieri. Uh, or Fieri. Um, we're going to dive into... Uh, something called Ursa RSA. Um, actually, wait, let me take a look at my notes. Is there anything else I want to say? Oh, you know what? I'll talk about one thing. So, we've got our Diffie Hellman, you know, key exchange. You know, we exchanged that secret key, and now, like, two people have agreed on some secret key, and maybe they've also agreed on some algorithm. Right? I showed you one kind of way to have an algorithm work, right? It, this worked when we were just transferring numbers, right? Um, here's another kind of thing. So there's an idea, or an algorithm called, or a type of algorithm called a cipher. So there's one called rote 13. It's a cipher called rote 13. And I'm going to do A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q, R, S, T, U, V, W, X, Y, and how, how do we say the last letter? Z. Yeah? Z? <laughs> we'll talk about that later. <laughs> uh, so let me just split these down. Let's see, I think I need the N over here. Yeah. Conveniently. Right? Just a nice convenience of the English alphabet that we have 26. Uh, oh, I guess I did forget. Uh, now I'm trying to find like a like a special spooky character. But it's going to be like, oh, you forgot about the trademark character, which is so important in English. No, okay, so we have 26 letters in the English alphabet so we can just split them in half and I might set up a cipher in the form of anything that I write when you receive the like the message just take every letter and translate it over to what the cipher says it should be so if I write the words um, hello there right this becomes um, U R Y Y and then where's the O? Uh, B, and then space, and then G U R E R. Uri begurer, right? Uh, and anybody who sees this not knowing what the algorithm is, be like, hmm, what's going on here, right? But the more messages they see, right, the more messages I write out, like, right, like more stuff. You start getting to a place where you can leverage you can leverage statistics. You might say, "Hey, I see the letter A appear a lot here." All right? There's lots of A's. Granted, I just mashed out keys. I didn't I didn't write stuff out. But you might go, "Oh, I see the A a lot." And you'll go, "Okay, well, what's the most commonly like used letter in English?" Right? Assuming that this is English, and that's I think E. Okay. E is the most common letter. So I'll go through and I'll replace every A. I'll say, oh, that thing, that A here, that's an E, and this is an E, and this is an E, and that's an E. Right? And then I go, okay, well, from the statistics of that, like all the thousands of messages maybe that I've collected, right? Um, what's the second most common letter? And then I correlate that to the second most common letter in English. Right, and that way I can start playing my whole like, you know, I'd like to buy a vowel, please, or whatever, and I get my letters. And you start filling in with uh, Wheel of Fortune or whatever. Right. So this is a way in which we can communicate a little bit, right? But if people start building up a a, a kind of a, a treasure trove of messages that you sent, they can leverage statistics for this and. Here, rote 13, the secret key is really 13. Like, rotate every, like, A gets rotated to N. B gets rotated to 8. But we could 
use the Diffie Hellman key exchange to come up with a different rotation. Right, rotate secret key. All right, that's something that we could do. Right. There's a bunch of other kind of weaker encryption algorithms. Uh, there's one single pass ooh, key encryption. One time pad. There's like an encry uh, an encryption technique that doesn't like it, it. It's good for like one time. It's similar to this rote 13, but it involves like heavier math underneath. And again, the more and more you use it, uh, the the less secure it becomes. What I'm trying to show you here is that. We want to get beyond just this like one time or like limited use thing. We want to have more robust and long term encryption. So enter Ursa. The RSA insurance group that's not what I'm looking for. RSA encryption. Let's get a little picture here. This one's pretty good. Recipients. I'm gonna find. Hmm, I'm trying to find a, a nice picture, because usually the thing is I draw this on the board, but uh, it's not very visible. I've noticed, um, so I just decided I wouldn't do it with the board. Now we're just gonna use the very first one here. Okay, so here is RSA encryption as a picture. So RSA, RSA is an algorithm and it stands for, stands for Rivest Shamir Edelman. It's one of the first public key crypto systems widely used for secure data transmission. Uh, Rivest Shamir and Leonard Edelman. Um, are there any nice pictures here? That's Shamir. And the other people, I guess, just aren't famous enough to be on here. Now, I don't want to make you look at the math of it. I was just hoping there might be a picture on here, and there isn't. So, what RSA encryption is... All oh right, I had it over here. Bob has... A key, a public key, and a private key. So Bob has a public key and a private key. The public key is shown to everyone and the private key is not shown to anyone. The public key and the private key are generated using a program. Right? You'll use a program and the program will generate a pair. So the public key and the private key, they are related. They are related. They're not the same thing. And it's very hard to, like, given just the public key, figure out what the private key is. Right? Not just very hard, virtually impossible. Right? It's that same idea of processes that are easy to generate or easy to do something, but really difficult to undo. Right? So there's some math to generate a private and a public. Bob publishes the public key might publish the public key on a website, such as if I go to circumpone, circumpone ban. Circumpone. Okay, so circumpone is this person named Drew DeVault. They're just a programmer who blogs on the internet. Um, but something that you might notice when you go on their website is, oh, have they hidden it now? Here. Okay, so what Circumpone used, oh, there you go, PGP. Circumpone has on their blog, right, Drew DeVault on their blog, they have all of a sudden just a random string of letters and numbers. And you'll notice this a lot. You'll notice this on, um, you know, bloggers' pages or journalists' pages, right? If I click on this, it takes me to this thing here, and it says, begin PGP public key block. And it's just a bunch of stuff. 
just a, just a bunch of random or seemingly random letters and numbers. Now, I think the first time I ran into this on somebody's website, I was like, if I hacked it, like, why am I seeing all this stuff, right? But what's going on here is they've published their public key, and the reason that a public key might be published is so that, so that if Bob wants to send a message, Bob wants to send a message and somebody else wants to verify that Bob was the one who sent that message, Bob can encrypt their message using their private key. And then anybody can decrypt that message using the public key. Right? So I have a message. I've published my public key. I use my private key to encrypt it. And I send it out. And any one of you, right? Say I'm going back to my old example of talking securely with John. Like I send it to John, but any one of you intercepts that message. You're able to see my public key and unencrypt it. So it's not a secure method of transporting the information. But what's interesting is that you can only, you can only decrypt the message with my public key if I'm the one who encrypted it with my secret key. So what we can use RSA for is that the person receiving the message can verify that it was sent by the original sender. Right? They can verify that it was sent by that particular person by using their public key to unencrypt the message. Right? So what somebody like Sir Compone here or Drew DeVault is doing is they say, hey, when I send you, if I send you an encrypted message and you want to make sure that I'm the one who sent it to you, you can use my public key to unencrypt it. Right? So somebody can't impersonate Drew DeVault they can't impersonate Drew DeVault because they don't have the corresponding private key. If somebody tried to send me a message saying, uh, like, say it's from my mom. Hey, it's your mom. Uh, move out. Stop, you know, living in our basement. And I go, that's not my mom. All right? It sounds like that's not, my mom would never say that. <laughs> um, and I can verify it by looking at my mom's public key, right? They, like, you know, decrypting that message, right? And verifying that that's, that wasn't from my mom because it's just a bunch of mash. Right? So that's what, that's what this part of RSA is used for, is verifying that a message is sent by a particular person. And then the other interesting part is, say that Bob has published the public key, and Alice, Alice can use the public key to package up any secret messages that Alice wants to send. So the public key is useful for two things. It can be used to verify the sender of a message, and it can also be used to send secret messages to that person. It's useful for those two things. So if I wanted to send something secret to Drew to Vault, and I only wanted Drew to be the only person who can open it up, I can use Drew's secret key, oh, sorry, Drew's public key to encrypt it, and only Drew is able to open it up. And the reason that works is that we've all agreed on some algorithm for it, right? So somebody might say, hey, I'm using the RSA algorithm, right? Here's my public key. If you want to send me secret messages, they encrypt it using this public key, and I'm the only one who can open it. So it's useful for those two things. Alice can verify that Bob has sent a message, like from Bob, and Bob can receive secret messages from Alice. And any person in between, this attacker, or as you often see, it's Alice, Bob, and Eve. There's always like, there's always Alice sending a message to Bob, and then sneaky Eve, uh, you know, swiping swiping the messages right if eve tries to listen in on a message if we're using the verification part of rsa there's nothing really eve can do except for read the message 
and Eve is not able to fabricate messages to send to Bob as Alice. Right? In this case here, Eve cannot fabricate a message from Alice to Bob because Eve does not have the secret key. And in the opposite way as well, if Bob tries to send a message to Alice using Alice's public key, Eve cannot open up the message. Right? So we've, we've thwarted anything that Eve could do over here. The thing here, though, is that we only have one line of secure communication. Like, communication is encrypted securely only from, like, the publisher of, uh, not the publisher, sorry, from the person who uses the public key to send it to the person who had generated the public key. So if we wanted two lines of communication, then both people would need to establish public keys. Does that sort of make sense to people? Again, I don't want you to like really fully understand everything, but just kind of neat stuff to know a little bit. Um, this is it's kind of us right now. So, has anybody seen XKCD before? Yeah, this is good stuff. So, generally, both with this cryptography stuff, or really any kind of stuff that involves communication between services. So you've talked about HTTP in a, what's that? Oh, did you just finish reading it? <laughs> yeah. Um, so, um, both with, with this stuff, or HTTP, or when you come back from uh, Remote Week, you're going to talk about web sockets, right? With all this stuff, I recommend thinking about it in terms of people talking to each other and exchanging pieces of paper, right? Thinking about it in terms of code or in terms of computers can be really, like, I think really difficult. Um, so start off with things like people and paper. Actually, I think I'm, I'm doing your WebSockets lecture, uh, so you're going to see more of that. Let's see. As far as RSA goes, there isn't really more that I want to say. I'm just going to put some links in the notes of that stuff that you want to explore. Um, we got the Diffie Hellman key exchange. And then, oh, here we go. I think that that's where I'm going to end talking about cryptography. And I'm going to very kind of lightly talk a little bit about authentication a little bit in terms of things that you haven't, like, not that this cryptography stuff isn't authentication, but this is like uh, just a bit more. Has anybody heard of multi-factor authentication? Cool, right? What is two-factor authentication? Has anybody heard of L two-factor authentication? Yeah. Cool. Supply an email and a phone number, uh, and the service uh, verifies both. Right? So, so sometimes, sometimes you might be logging into something like Google, like you might be logging into your Google account, and then it'll be like, we sent you a text message, right? Or we, we did something on your phone, and you have to go to your phone and go like, yes, it was me. Right? Has anybody experienced that before? Two-factor authentication, and the two factors there are, you know, your, um, I'm just going to change this to rather supply an email and a phone number, I'm going to supply a password and a phone number, because I will be signing in with a password, so that's one factor, it's like something I know, the password that I'm using to log in, and then the other thing is, they want to check with something that maybe I own just to have like another extra level of things. So, so usually the first factor is something you know, like a passcode. Who goes there, right? Whatever. Who twice like an owl, you know, like that kind of stuff. Some, some passcode. And then a phone number is really just a vehicle for them to check something that we have or own, right? such as a phone, right? Really, that's, that's, that's 
the one that I always think of. Technically, this is like multi, you know, maybe two, three, etc. Multi-factor authentication. We can, we can have more factors. I've seen it broken down as something you know, something you have, and something you are. Right? That could be a third factor. Something you, you know, so like a password, something you have, right, such as a phone, and something you are, such as a blood sample, right, or such as like biometric, like fingerprint stuff. Or I was talking to someone who had like a, a company that when you try to like sign into like really secure stuff, like maybe you work in the government and you have to access, you know, things. You do your password, you do your phone, you do your fingerprint, and then it calls like somebody who knows you, like a loved one, right? Like like your mom. And you're in like a video call with your mom and your mom has to be like, yes, that is Nima, right? And it's just that like extra layer of, of verification just to really authorize that person, like authenticate them and say that this is, this is who they say they are. Right? You can go absurdly deep into that. All right, so uh, multi factor authentications um I wonder if there's any neat images here right so here's you know that's a multi-factor we've got our fingerprint um I actually don't know if that that person who was telling me about that like video call with your loved one I don't know if they kept doing that um but yeah so multi-factor authentication I'll put this in the notes kind of neat to kind of read about so we've got that. Um, there's an idea called single sign-on. Has anybody heard of single sign-on before? Yeah, what's single sign-on? Mm -hmm. There you go. Yeah, so y like you have a website, you sign into just that one website, and then everything else kind of falls out of that. Right, everything else is authenticated through that one thing. So the examples that I have are: you can sign in with Facebook, GitHub, Twitter, Google. One service that does the sign-on, right? One service that does the sign-on, and it authenticates for other services. So if I'm setting up my own website, and I don't want to set up like an authentication flow, right? I could do the whole bcrypt thing that you've done, or I could say. Like, I don't want to. I don't want to do all the storing of passwords and all that. I just don't want to. What if somebody hacks my service and leaks all the passwords or something? Like something goes wrong. Now I'm in deep, you know, trouble. Instead, what I could do is leverage the fact that Facebook or GitHub or Twitter or Google already have had their engineers solve that problem, right? And they've exposed like APIs or methods that I can use to plug that stuff into my website. So, you know, it's quick, easy peasy, right? Just quick. And it's secure because all those companies have already built that stuff, so I offload that work to them. Anytime somebody wants to sign in, they don't give that information to me. They give that information to Google or to Twitter, and then Twitter tells me, yes, this person has signed in. Or Twitter tells me, no, this person did not sign in properly. Like they put in a wrong password or something. And I never actually see their password. Right, I never actually see that stuff. So, you know, the pros are that we've offloaded all that work to them. I don't need to figure out that logic, right? And in fact, honestly, I kind of encourage you to take a look at doing this stuff instead is using sign on with Facebook, GitHub, Twitter, Google, wherever you can, right? Wherever you can, just offload that to them. Um, in the notes, I'm going to give you a link to a thing uh, called you write it in here. I'm going to give you a link to a thing called Passport, which is a node library for authentication, e.g. with Google, etc. Right? Um, honestly, I might even show you a quick demo in a minute. So, there is a con, though, or a couple. One of the things is that like 
when you're doing this kind of like single sign-on stuff, like somebody signing on with Google or whatever, right? Now you've linked your activity on this website through your Google stuff, and that's stuff that some people are like uncomfortable with. I'm sure we can think of websites that we don't want to sign in to using like, you know, Google or something. Uh, I personally don't want to sign in to like, I don't know, like video game stuff with Google, right? Because then I don't want some troll or griefer or whatever to then figure out what my Gmail is and then send me, you know, you know, threats. Right? Or I don't want to sign into banking stuff with certain services. I don't want my, say I was signing up online to be a nominee in like the municipal elections or whatever. I personally don't want to sign on to it with my Twitter account. Personally. I might even hide that stuff. <laughs> right? Um, I don't know. Maybe you can come up with other examples. But the real big one is who's responsible in case of a breach? If I'm a service using Facebook sign on and then Facebook leaks a bunch of info and are my users going to get mad at me? Are my users going to get mad at Facebook? Like who's who's responsible for this stuff? And that that just gets a little hairy. Right? I don't think we're really going to explore this anymore uh right now, but it's just something to think about. Okay. So I want to show you a couple short videos. Um I'm going to turn up the audio here so Calgary can hear as well. Uh, the audio is not really that important. The first one here is ba -ba -ba, former CIA. Oh, this wasn't what I was looking for. But nope. So the the one I want to find is uh oh, ooh, I got this. Do I have it in here? I thought it was that one. Oh no, these these are not the ones that were sent. Okay, so so there's one particular one where it's um does anybody know what social engineering is? So social engineering is the idea of not using technical methods for extracting secure information from people, right? Such as figuring out what somebody's password is. Um like uh, hey, what's your favorite social insurance number, right? Like, what's what's just your favorite social insurance number? Um, that's one way of you know maybe kind of like crappily social engineering someone. Um, yeah, manipulating people into giving information. So this is a pretty interesting video. Um, we're basically. So I invited a few of the world's best hackers to try to hack me and show me where my vulnerabilities are. And now I'm going to meet them in Las Vegas for DEF CON, the biggest hacker convention of the year. They're going to hack me using social engineering, which is essentially hacking without any code. They just use a phone and an internet connection. Do you want to do a sample of phishing call? What's phishing? Phishing is voice solicitation. And basically um, what you do is you use the phone to extract information or data points that can be used in a later attack. Let's do it. Okay. You, who are you going to call? Maybe I'll call your cell phone provider okay. and see if I can get them to give me your email address. I, I bet they're good. I bet they have my back. <laughs> but yeah, go, go for it. I'm going to spoof from your number, so it's going to look like it's calling from you. Okay. Hi. I'm actually, I'm so sorry. Can you hear me okay? I, my baby, I'm sorry. <laughs> my... <laughs> my husband's like, we're about to apply for a loan, and we just had a baby, and he's like, get this done by today, so I'm so sorry, I can't I, um, call you back. <laughs> I'm trying to log into our account for uses information, and I can't remember what email address we use to log the account. The baby's crying, and um, can, can you help me? Awesome. In just 30 seconds, uh, email .com? Jessica gets access to my personal email address. Now, if I needed to um, add our older daughter on our account so she could call in and make changes, how would I need to go about doing that? You would have to send me a secure pin through a text message? Yeah. Well, the thing is, I don't think I'll be able to receive a text message if I'm on the phone. Oh, I'm not on there either? I, so I thought when we got married, um, he added me to the account. Jess uses my girlfriend's name and a fake social security number. 
5127. To set up her own personal access to my account. Wait, I'm sorry. So there's no password on my account right now? Can I set that up? She even gets the support person to change my password. Thank you so much for your help today. So she just basically blocked me out of my own account. I'll get her fed after this. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Holy shit. So they, they, just gave, they just gave you access to my entire cell phone account. You're going to have to go on and change your password now because it's Jess my name. And all it took was a crying baby and a phone call. Yeah. What? Yeah. That's one of my favorite videos. Oh. Huh? muted so i was just saying that watching those like social engineering videos is kind of like a lot of fun uh so i recommend just in your downtime why not look up more of those because it's pretty funny also horrifying um so so you know don't use the same password for everything maybe use something like a. I have like a password manager um what's that If my password manager gets breached, then I'm gonna move into the woods. Honestly, like that's that's about it. <laughs> um, so so there's this thing called Amazon Snowball, and what Amazon Snowball is is for secure data transfer. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so say you're a company that has like a ton of data that needs to be transferred from one location to another. Um, just like a ton of data, more than you could can conceivably upload and download from somewhere else through secure channels, because maybe it's like terabytes and terabytes and terabytes of data. Amazon developed this, developed, I don't know how much of a product it really is. It's a plastic box. Um, it's a plastic box that's filled with essentially solid state drives. <laughs> um, and you know, you plug... You plug your machines into it, and you upload any data that you want. And then the Amazon people, they show up at your house, or not your house, at your company, you know, your office. Like, they give you the snowball, you fill it up, and then they take the snowball and they bring it to the other office and download the info. Right? Like, it's the least technical kind of way of doing data transfer. But the thing is, there's there's like a... If you're transferring data from your machine to to like a machine next to you, that can be done really, really fast. Like you can do that at super, super high rates, right? If you're transferring through the internet, right, like there's there's a lot of it takes a lot of time and you can only transfer like a set amount of stuff with like that throughput. So so it turns out that you know if if <laughs> if you want to transfer between cities, this can this can be a uh, thing. Now a couple years ago. Amazon came up with a thing called the Amazon Snowmobile. <laughs> so, so at, at Amazon, said, well, this is great. an Amazon reinvent uh, in 2016. So they're like conference. Um, I mean, honestly, I'll just I think maybe I'll let them talk about it. Nah, it takes it takes a little while for the video. So this dude's just like. Snow snowball, pretty cool, right? But you can you can still only transfer like a limited amount of data. We have customers that have like petabytes, like petabytes of data that needs to be transferred. So here is what like they do. I also kind of want to show off the way that they present this stuff because it's kind of hilarious. And you might take some tips from this for your for your midterm demos and for your final project demos collect data, have X bytes of data. They said, well, I love Snowball Edges, but if I have an X byte of data, I'm going to need like 10,000 of those Snowball Edges. And that's probably too many for us to want to manage. So is there something you can do that allow us to move X bytes of data so we can leverage the cloud as well? So we thought about that. Though. That was a tricky one. And the first thing that came to mind was we're going to need a bigger box. 
Honestly, it just keeps going on, like it's just a guitar solo. So, I mean, genuinely the idea is, well just, <laughs> yeah, there's all these people taking pictures of this semi. I love the idea that, like, they didn't really come up with a new product. Just like, just buy a bunch of semi trucks, man. <laughs> like, um, so so I don't know if this is any inspiration for your final, you know, final kind of demos. Um, you know, kind of go wild with it. Uh, I just, I love, I love the idea of this like guitar solo and whatever as they slowly drive the truck onto the. It kind of reminds me of like Silicon Valley. I don't know if you have watched the show, but yeah. Um, and I mean, really, the idea is just you fill up the snowmobile, 45 foot long container, connect it to your data center, uh, center yeah, fill her up, <laughs> yeah, and then transport data to you know to wherever to AWS or to like another one of your data centers, right? So this is for companies that have huge data centers and they want to migrate maybe their data to the cloud, right? The cloud comes to you, <laughs> so uh, you know that's that's kind of that. I'm just I love the idea of like have y'all seen Fury Road, like Mad Max? So I love the idea of something along the lines of this, like just a caravan of people transferring data from one data center to another um, and you know maybe like like Tom Hardy shows up at your data center a filler up right a max and then just kind of <laughs> just kind of driving um, I mean maybe this is the future we're kind of heading towards in one way or another uh, just transferring data between data centers do you all want to see a, a, a demo of passport or do you want to end the lecture here you want to watch Mad Max now? For Passport, I'll give you like a link to the to the thing, but with Passport JS here, um, there's just a good kind of boilerplate that you can take a look at. You go Passport Authenticate Facebook. Does this look like JavaScript? <laughs> yeah, because it is, right? It's just a JavaScript library that you pull into your project, and we'll go at the top of it some middleware that says Authenticate with Facebook, and then every time you want to do authentication, you pass the thing through like Passport Authenticate before you run the rest of the the rest of the callback, and it'll do that stuff for you, right? I just don't want to focus on this right now, and I genuinely don't recommend doing this for your midterms or for your finals. Like, don't. Don't focus on login flow or authentication for your midterms or finals. Like, focus on features. Name. Um, cool. So I think with that, might as well, might as well bring it to a close. Does that sound good to everyone? Are there any questions? No. You've you've kept my secret admirer message, and that's from me to you. Uh, Calgary, thanks for tuning in today. I will send out notes. Have fun with the rest of the midterms. Um, have fun with the demos on Monday. Uh, it is Monday, right? Yeah, have fun with the demos on Monday and then have a good time with the remote week. Uh, cool. See y'all later. Bye-bye. Uh,